Terrific. Thank you so much for the invitation. That was an amazing video. Um, we can use that video as a, as a jumping off point for this conversation. So uh, to be really clear, <clears throat> I, I'm, I stand outside of, <clears throat> sorry, I stand outside of the sort of animal liberation or, or even um, sort of the, the broader environmental movement. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley uh, where I've taught race and American law for 20 plus years. Really what I'm an expert in is in racism in the contemporary United States. And that includes the way in which racism is used as a political weapon. And we're in a moment now, 2020, in which we can see very clearly the way in which racism is being weaponized politically uh, by people like Donald Trump, but, but really by the Republican Party at every level, um, by right-wing media, including media personalities like Rush Limbaugh or Laura Ingram. Um, we can also see the way in which it's being funded by some of the biggest polluters like the Koch brothers, uh, some of the biggest Wall Street financiers like, like the Mercers. So racism has been politicized. What does that mean for us? It means when you watch a video like that, that there's really two arguments that are being advanced. And we want to be clear that both are complementary. There's not a tension between them, but they are different arguments. And we want to be very clear to hear them both. One argument is that racism is an evil, is a moral evil. And it's incumbent on each of us as decent people to stand up to that evil, to, to, to protest it, to repudiate it, to build a world without that racism, to build a world in which we truly believe in our shared humanity, our, our shared interconnection. Um, that's one message. Here's the other message. Fighting racism is not simply a matter of morality. It's a matter of survival for all of us, whatever color we are, whether we're black or brown, whether we're Native American or Asian American, or whether we're white. If we're not fighting racism, we're not fighting the number one weapon against us. And I wanna emphasize again, these two messages are completely complementary, but their work they're doing is pretty different. I suspect that uh, many within the animal liberation movement, like many within the environmental movement, are sympathetic to the cause of racial justice, but also a little bit worried about it, a little bit worried that it's a distraction from the main issue that they want to work on. And while they understand that fighting racism is important, there's also a, a little bit of de detachment, a little bit of a sense of like, we could do that, but we really got to focus on these priorities. And lots of other people are focusing on racial justice. Why don't we stay focused? Let's not get distracted. Let's not get divided. Let's not let our movement be divided by this, this issue. In other words, if you understand the argument for fighting racism primarily or exclusively as a moral argument, then you tend to frame it as one in which you're being called upon to make a sacrifice to do what's moral. And that's easy to agree to when you're in a comfortable position, but the more desperate you are, uh, the more insistent you are, the more focused you are, the less willing you are to make that sacrifice. Whereas that second argument that says that racism is a weapon against us, that's saying, hey, the fight against racism isn't a sacrifice for white people. The fight against racism is a gain for whites, not simply because, hey, it makes you a better person, but also because it's what allows you to make progress on the things that are most important to you, whether that's economic redistribution, health care for all, averting climate collapse, or saving animals. Okay, so that's, that's the argument in a nutshell. I'm going to walk through, uh, if I can, a PowerPoint. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay. This is the PowerPoint. Let's, let's play it. All right. So I'm going to frame this in terms of dog whistle politics. And here's the thing. Dog whistle politics is this idea that politicians are mobilizing racism by speaking in code. And you might be responding to that by saying, 
this isn't code anymore. This is out and out bigotry. And I get that. I think for that for a lot of progressives, we watch what Donald Trump is doing, uh, or Governor Kemp uh, in, in, in Georgia, or Ron DeSantis in Florida, uh, and we say that these guys are just out and out racist. Um, but that's us. Uh, that, it turns out, is not the majority of Americans. So for a couple of years, I co-founded and co-directed a national study on how to beat dog whistle politics. And one of the things that we did is we said, okay, how receptive are people to dog whistle messages? So I'm going to play you a dog whistle message. And as I play it, you're going to see lines scrolling across the screen. These lines are, uh, are reflect a dial test. People are going to dial up above 50 when they find a message convincing. They will dial down below 50 when they don't find a message convincing, when they reject the message. And you'll see that there's going to be a, a different set of lines. Um, there's base, opposition, persuadable, advocates, and union. Base is the progressive base. That's about 23% of the population of the country. Opposition is the reactionary base, Donald Trump's hardcore supporters. Let me just be clear, we're never gonna get them. This is, I'm not arguing like how to reach them. I don't, whatever, it's not gonna happen. That's about 18%. Persuadables, you can understand persuadables is actually conflicted voters. They're voters who agree simultaneously with both progressive and reactionary positions. Obviously, we need their support if we're actually going to shift who gets elected and change the politics, change the policies of this country. Advocates are people who are engaged professionally in politics. Unions are union households. This is, let's listen to this dog whistle message and see how people react. And let's see if they would Our do. leaders must prioritize keeping us safe and ensuring that hardworking Americans have the freedom to prosper. Taking a second look at people coming from terrorist countries who wish us harm or at people from places overrun with drugs and criminal gangs is just common sense. And so is curbing illegal immigration, so our communities are no longer flooded with people who refuse to follow our laws. We need to make sure we take care of our own people first, especially the people who politicians have cast aside for too long to cater to whatever special interest groups line their pockets, yell the loudest, or riot in the street. Okay. Special interest groups, people who, lie, who, who uh, riot in the streets, sanctuary cities, illegal aliens. This is the rhetoric of the right when you look at how people reacted, you can see that advocates, those are professional organizers, they hated this message. But you can also see the progressive base found it convincing. Union households found it convincing. Persuadables were carried by this message. And of course, the opposition loved it. Right? This, is, this is an enormous warning. But this is saying, the rhetoric that so many of us find repulsive and obviously racist is broadly convincing. Okay, now you might say to yourself, okay, broadly convincing, but isn't that just white folks, right? It, like, like people of color at least are gonna see through this. This is the a response to that same message broken down by race. And what you see there is that 61% of whites find that message convincing, but so do 60% of Latinos, so do 54% of African Americans. You also see that in terms of the percentage of whites, Latinos, and African Americans who dialed to 100, that is, could not have found that message more convincing. That was 18% of whites, but 16% of Latinx, and 15% of African Americans. In other words, these messages, these coded, like, like I want to be clear, the message is, is racist. The message says people of color are inherently dangerous and threatening. Um, whites are decent and hardworking. That's what the message is literally communicating 
but not expressly communicating. And when we look to see how much this code resonates, we see it not only resonates with progressives, with union households, with conflicted voters, it resonates with the majority of Latinx and African Americans as well. This is an enormous challenge for us. And I want to, I'm, I'm going to pause and do a little bit of history to just to make clear why this is such a challenge. Let's see if we can go on here. This is the only big chunk of text I'm going to show you, but it's a very important chunk of text because it gives us a sense of where dog whistle politics comes from. It really comes out of 1963. This is Robert Novak. He's a conservative journalist. He's just attended a meeting of the Republican National Committee, and he comes out of that. And in the Washington Post, he publishes an article called The White Man's Party, and he says, he says, a good many, perhaps a majority of the party's leadership, envision substantial political gold to be mined in the racial crisis by becoming, in fact, though not in name, the white man's party. The racial crisis. This is the civil rights movement. What's happening? The civil rights movement is a demand for equality by African Americans. It's, in 1963, succeeding. Racial segregation is falling, racial norms are changing, many whites are being made anxious by this, uh, by these changes. And at this point, you can imagine our political leadership class saying, change always produces anxiety, but this has to change, racism's wrong, let's lead the way. Or you can imagine what actually happened. The Republican Party said, oh wow, we've been relatively racially moderate up to now. We're the party of Lincoln. But if we can take advantage of the rising racial anxiety, we could win some votes. That's the racial crisis. That's the thrust of what's happening here. But here's this other phrase, in fact, though not in name. Precisely because of the success of the civil rights movement, politicians on a national level can no longer compete by standing up and expressly endorsing white supremacy. So now they're going to communicate sympathy for white dominance in code, in terms, in language, in images that allow them to invoke white dominance, to invoke specters of minority inferiority, but then to turn around and deny that they're doing any such thing. Right? And so this, it, it turns out, is uh, states' rights. This was the language of um, oh, you know, the federal government has too much power, when in fact it meant uh, that the federal government should not control the right, the South's ability to continue to oppress and humiliate African Americans. Um, okay, it was this sort of language. How did it work? Barry Goldwater was the Republican candidate. He lost. He lost, and it was a crushing defeat. This was a national landslide for Lyndon Johnson, the Democratic candidate. And many, many, many pundits turned around and said, "You know, th th that's it. They're, 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 you know, this we're fundamentally a liberal country. We're liberal both racially. Lyndon, John, Lyndon Johnson had supported the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, Goldwater had opposed it." But we were liberal also economically in the sense that Lyndon Johnson was proposing a war on poverty and Barry Goldwater, he hated activist government. He hated the way in which government regulated capitalism, created routes of upward mobility and taxed the rich to pay for it. Barry Goldwater was the son of a wealthy retail family and he wanted to roll back the New Deal. So that's what he campaigned on. So pundits look at 1964 and say, we're fundamentally a liberal country, liberal in terms of race, liberal in terms of our idea that government ought to work for people rather than for corporations. But there was an alarm bell in the night, and it was the, the states across the South. Those states were diehard Democratic states. They hated Republicans. They just voted for Republican. Those states were committed to New Deal liberalism. They had been enormously aided by New Deal, which brought electricity to much of the South. Goldwater was promising to dismantle the New Deal. And what was the threat? It was that the most committed Democrats, 
those who are most committed to a vision which government works for people rather than corporations could be convinced to vote for, persuaded to vote for, a Republican who promised rule by the rich if they were appealed to in racial terms. That was the threat. Would it come to pass? It wasn't clear to Richard Nixon in 1968, but by 1970, his number crunchers and Democratic pollsters too had suggested that yes, the New Deal coalition of the white working class, African-Americans and white liberals could be broken apart through racial appeals. And so Nixon goes to full dog whistling. He starts talking about states' rights. He starts talking about law and order. Would it win? This is 1972. This is 1972. This is eight years after Lyndon Johnson has won in his landslide Richard Nixon wins in an even bigger landslide. Richard Nixon had thought, had described dog whistle politics as the Southern strategy. He thought it was a way to win racially resentful whites in the South. But by 1972, the results confirmed this wasn't just a Southern strategy. This was a national strategy. Now, to be clear, between 1964 and 1972 and 1972 and the present, a lot was going on, the Vietnam War, gay rights, women's rights, civil rights, anti-war protesting, uh, Nixon's corruption. Still, 1964 marks a tectonic shift in American politics. 1964 is the last time, the last time, a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. Lyndon Johnson, landslide, 64. Last time, not Jimmy Carter, not Bill Clinton, certainly not Barack Obama. No Democratic candidate for president has won a majority of the white vote since 1964. Nine out of 10. Today, Republican candidates for president draw 90% of their support from white voters. 98%. Today, 98% of Republican elected officials are white. Three out of five, three out of five whites are voting for the GOP. In other words, to an enormous extent, to a shocking extent, the white man's party that Barry Goldwater called for in 1963 is precisely what we're combating now in 2020. I, 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 I'm gonna come back, let me, let me modify that. It is not a white man's party in the sense that it is the party of whites as a racial group. It is the party of whiteness, whiteness as an ideology, whiteness as a mindset. And that mindset is one that many whites repudiate, and to be frank, that many people of color endorse, especially lighter skinned, uh, could be African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx, especially middle class or upper class. Whiteness is an ideology that says being lighter is better. A lot of white folks embrace that, consciously or unconsciously. Many reject it. Some people of color also accept it. Many fight it. But that's what we're talking about, the party of whiteness. And so the question then becomes, how do we respond? How do we defeat this? And I want to be clear, this is so challenging precisely because this has been going on for more than 50 years. And I want to be further clear, part of the problem is Democrats decided they would respond to dog whistling by imitating it. They're a new generation of Democrats, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, and they don't think the way the old Democratic Party did. They've called for an end to welfare as we know it, so welfare can be a second chance, not a way of life. They've sent a strong signal to criminals by supporting the death penalty. And they've rejected the old tax and spend politics. Clinton's balanced 12 budgets, and they've proposed a new plan investing in people, detailing $140 billion in spending cuts they'd make right now. Clinton Gore, for people, for a change. So I want to be clear that I don't expect us to see um, uh, Democrats responding in this full imitation the way Clinton and Gore did. But I also want to be clear 
the tendency to imitate dog whistle themes is still very powerful. Dog whistling tells stories of threat from people of color or stories of scarce resources and government is the problem. And we hear that all the time from Democrats all the, and, and, and often from progressives. So be very careful to listen when progressives or Democrats are telling stories that amplify the idea that people of color are the problem or that there's real scarcity that we face. And to give you one example, some of the Biden ads that talked about the coronavirus also blamed China. That's Trump's frame. Democrats have a really unfortunate and very long history of imitation. And that's part of the reason why these dog whistle frames are convincing even to a majority of progressives. We've been hearing it from our own side as well. Okay, so let's presume we don't want to imitate this crap. Yeah, but what else might we do? Yeah. Let me see. There we go. Here's another thing that we can do. And this is very popular now. We're hearing this a lot from uh, what I might call the race left. The race left is like, hey, we, get, we need to call this stuff out. And if, and if politicians are bigots, we need to call them bigots. Here's what a version of that might look like. Is this what Donald Trump and Ed Gillespie mean by the American dream? Latino Victory Fund paid for and is responsible for the content of this advertisement. It's an incredibly powerful ad, but you got to step back and say, okay, is the point of sort of political campaign ad, and frankly, is the point of movement building to shame people for being bigots? And is that an effective strategy to win elections or to build movements? And here I want to be clear, Republicans loved that ad. They loved it because they already had an established way to deal with it. Remember, dog whistling is code that comes across as common sense to majorities of Americans, including majorities of Democrats. So majorities of folks don't understand talking about illegal aliens or terrorists as racist. And when the left turns around and says, that's the same thing as being a Klan member, that's the same thing as driving a pickup truck and flying a Confederate flag, majorities of people uh, are made uncomfortable by that. And, the, and dog whistle politicians try and take advantage. They first, they, they do this sort of uh, defense. They say first, they put all this racist stuff out there, but in code. Then they turn around and said, what, me? I never said anything racist. I just talked about illegals, or I just said, taking a knee to protest police violence disrespects the flag. I never said anything racist. And then they turn around and said, but you know what? Those crazy people on the left just called me a racist. And by extension, they called all of my supporters and all of the people who hear me as reasonable they call them racists and bigots too. And this actually backfires. So again, the, the Republicans love that Latino victory ad. Here's another point that I want to make. This is something I didn't know, but we ran focus groups to try and understand how to defeat dog whistle politics. I was not surprised to learn that when you, when you say hey, dog whistling manipulates racism, it turns off many whites. What I was surprised to learn is that sort of a hard-hitting message alienates many people of color too. Uh, the message from the race left is very often, we are facing a racist president who was elected by millions of racist voters who embodies 400 years of racism. Now let's go change the system. 
when you describe a problem in a way that's that huge, that overwhelming, you know, maybe you get people, some people in the street, but a lot of people were actually demobilized by that message. The whole thing just felt so intimidating, so overwhelming, so big. Um, this is something I hadn't realized. Uh, the activists love this message. Hey, Trump's a bigot. But many people in black and brown communities actually don't like the message. It feels too big. It feels like something that's just overwhelming. So imitating it is a disaster. Naming it and challenging it directly can backfire. What else can you do? Here's another thing that's very common. Go silent. And this I want to say, very often you hear this from uh, different movements, class movements, the environmental movement that says, hey, we can't challenge it because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, divisive. Obviously, we don't want to imitate it. We should just ignore it. So watch this clip. This clip shows what happens when dog whistling is ignored and also shows a different sort of message that can actually win. And, I want, and, and, and it's very important. This is among precisely the white voters who we're told are most hostile to messages challenging dog whistle politics and talking directly about race. Ian, can I pause you really quickly? I sure, hold on. Yeah. I, just wanna, I think there's something we could do that would make the video show up a little better. If you close the screen share and then try sharing screen again and check the little box in the bottom left that says optimize for video. Okay, so st stop, stop screen share, hit, hit share screen again. And, and then optimize screen for video clip. Perfect. Cool. Try it again. Yeah. All right. Directed a national research project on how to defeat Trumpism. A group called Our Minnesota Future tested our insights with rural voters in that state, the sort of rural white voters who dominate in the swing states that ABT voters insist we must win. For the test, they showed rural whites a big postcard just like the one the Republican Party had already sent out. It was full of racial dog whistling. The very first sentence stated, my opponents are demanding more sanctuary cities for criminal and illegal aliens. And you know what? Most white voters said they agreed. So next, they showed people a sample Democratic postcard. This one started by saying, Minnesotans work hard and expect to earn enough to own a home, provide our kids a quality education, take occasional vacations, and save for retirement. In other words, it promised economic solutions, but stayed silent on race. So how did it do? When asked to choose between the Republican message and the race silent Democratic message, the blue message lost by 11 percentage points. Bottom line. Staying silent on race is a disaster for Democrats because it allows the Republicans to continue to divide us along racial lines. We have to address racial division. But how? Too often, when progressives talk about racism, we seem to fault white people in general. And for obvious reasons, this turns off a lot of white voters. So next, our Minnesota future showed these same voters another postcard. This one said, Minnesotans work hard to provide for our families. Whether we're white, black, or brown, fifth generation or newcomer, we all want to build a better future for our children. This message of cross-racial solidarity beat the Republican message by 14 points. Talking about race didn't mean the Democrats lost, just the opposite. It's the only way we win. This is the merge the left strategy. It merges whites and people of color, those fighting for economic populism, and those... So I'll stop, I'll stop it there. This is super important. I want to emphasize those numbers. That's a 25-point swing between what happens when you ignore race and you lose to dog whistle messages and what happens when you name race in the form of cross-racial solidarity and you beat dog whistle messages. And that 25 point swing, that's among white voters who initially expressed sympathy for the dog whistle message. So it's an, it's a, it's an enormous change. Why does it work?
Let's step back for a second and really understand what's happening with dog whistle politics, with the, with the core right-wing narrative, because this is precisely the narrative that we have to defeat if we're gonna win. So what the right-wing narrative is doing is it's using race in order to protect the interests of the rich by demonizing government. So it's using two sorts of narratives, a scarcity narrative that says, hey, there's not enough health care, there's not enough welfare, and then turns around and says, people of color or uh, welfare queens or illegal aliens are getting health care and flooding our hospitals. That's a scarcity narrative. But it's not just one that targets people of color, it's one that goes on to say, hate government. Hate government because it's taxing hardworking Americans to pay for that welfare or to pay for that health care. Why hate government? Because the right, the 1% want us to turn against the idea that government should work for people. When we turn against that idea, it allows corporations and wealthy family dynasties to more easily hijack government. And we get a dynamic in which we are encouraged to trust ourselves to the marketplace. Now I'm telling this story in terms of corporate power, but we can connect up corporate power to animal liberation. We can think to ourselves, part of the huge challenge you all face is the power of industrial agriculture. Uh, and indeed, one of the ways that industrial agriculture exercises its power is by pushing legislators to pass laws to protect us even from learning what's happening inside of these uh, factory farms. Where does that corporate power come from? It doesn't come from an argument that says, hey, corporations should be powerful. It comes from an argument that says, hey, there are welfare queens out there and you ought to hate government for rewarding those wel welfare queens. That's one, the scarcity model, the scarcity story. The other is the threat narrative. There are dangerous hoodlums, there are illegal aliens, there are terrorists, all dog whistles for people of color. Fear those people, but hate government for not doing enough. Hate government in the form of the sanctuary city, uh, or in the form of open borders, or in the form of more rights for criminals than for victims. There, again, you see this effort to encourage people to turn against government. And when we do, when we give up on government, then corporations and the wealthy 1% are more able to hijack it. I want to focus on this for just a moment. This is what dog whistle politics are, is doing. Now, you look at the, the, the graph in red, that's the US state and federal prison population. You can see the direct connection between dog whistle politics and this graph. When politicians like Nixon start talking about law and order and Ronald Reagan and then Bill Clinton joins in, it's that sort of rhetoric that translates into government policies, that translates into systematic government violence against communities of color, leading to mass incarceration, leading to police brutality. That's directly a result of dog whistle politics. And at the same time, it's important to understand that that rhetoric is being used to divide and distract while the rich, while the big corporations are hijacking government and running it for their own benefit. That's the green line, that's economic inequality. The point here is both of these are a function of dog whistle politics. And the further point is if you wanna fight either of them, you have to fight them both simultaneously because it's precisely division that is being weaponized against all of us in a way that does systematic violence against communities of color and builds corporate control over government. That's the core insight of a race class approach. That's the core insight that we wanna communicate in a race class story, racial division as class warfare, racial division as the primary weapon in the class war being waged by large corporations and powerful elites against all the rest of us. So what is that race class story? Distrust greedy elite stoking division. They're the source of the real threat. Is there threat in our lives? Yes. It doesn't come from your neighbors of different colors, different religion. It comes from corporations and powerful elite stoking division. Is there scarcity in our lives? Yes. It's not because some people are getting too much welfare or too much healthcare. 
it's because corporations don't want to pay their fair share. Amazon pays zero in corporate income taxes. That's the source of scarcity. Distrust, greedy, elite, stoking division. Join together across race lines. The only way we assemble the multiracial progressive wave we need to change this country's direction is if we come to see our fates linked with people of different religions and different races and different sexual orientations, different genders, we must join together across these lines of social division, especially across race lines. And finally, demand government for all. Too often progressives see government as the enemy, and I, and I, and I get it. Government and the control of corporations is hugely problematic. Government as a source of systematic violence against communities of color, it's, it's, it's outrageous, it's awful. But we can't give up on government. That's precisely what the, the, the powerful elites want. Instead, we must repudiate government in the way it works in the service of corporations and instead demand that government be what it's supposed to be, government by and for all of us. What does this look like in practice? This is a message on immigration, but we could also alter it slightly to, to start thinking about uh, uh, environmental issues or animal, animal rights issues. Notice that it starts by talking about race overtly and including everyone. I wanna be very clear on this. These sorts of messages are race conscious. So you might say, regardless of where we come from, what our color is or how we worship, um, then you, you know, we've got this every family wants what's best for their children, but you could, you could modify that and you could say every family understands that animals should be treated with, with, with kindness and compassion and should not be wantonly victimized or injured, right? You could just, a general, we all know this, and then turn around and explain where the real threat comes from. But today, certain politicians and their greedy lobbyists hurt everyone by handing kick kickbacks to the rich, defunding our schools, threatening our seniors. You might say, but today certain politicians and their greedy lobbyists defend industrial agriculture, uh, making sure that they can prioritize profits over decency, even going so far as blinding us to what's going on in the farms and factories that are operating in our names and under our government, right? This is sort of where's the real threat coming from? And then name division as a weapon against all of us, then they turn around and point the finger for our hard times at new immigrants, even tearing families apart and losing children. You can, you can do this in terms of immigration. You can say, then they turn around um, and encourage competition over scarce resources. Uh, then they turn around and invent lies that try and pit us against each other. And finally, when we reject scapegoating and come together, we can make this a nation we're proud to leave all of our kids, whether we're white, black, or brown, from down the street or across the globe, this last part is so important. It's doing two things. One, it's moving beyond condemning the opposition to calling for a vision that we all share and that we're committed to. So it's got an affirmative, here's what we're for, incredibly important. And also, notice the way it's talking about race, whether we're white, black, or brown. It's race conscious, but race conscious in an inclusive way, race conscious in a way that is designed to communicate we must build a multiracial society in which all of us of every racial group, whites included, have a place, can find security, can find joy, right? That's the structure of the message. Let me, so, so this, is a, this is sort of the analytic form. Here's what it might look like. And now, aha, here's Amber, who's from, who's from Oakland. Whether you're a black working class woman in Columbus, Ohio, or a white father in Kentucky, or a Latina student in Phoenix, it is the same ruling class using the same played out tactics to make us hate each other based on race, gender, religion, and sexuality. 
They are trying to make us point fingers in the wrong direction while we're all struggling and they are thriving. And we're struggling to build the families that we want with access to the healthcare that we need, provided by the jobs that bring us joy in order to manage the crippling debt from those fun yet incredibly expensive degrees that we kind of don't really use. We gotta change who's in charge. It's time to give someone else a chance. And it's on all of us to actually support and cheer on a new generation of leaders. We choose us. We choose us. Don't you choose us? I would choose us. Like, I mean, us. Duh. I love Amber. Whether you're a black working... Not, not enough to watch that again, though. All right, so so this is my last screen. Let me just summarize some key points. Defeating racism, we all have to do it, not just because it's the moral thing to do, but because it's actually the number one weapon in the class way, a war that is being waged against us. So defeating racism, defeating racial division, building cross-racial solidarity, that is the right thing to do. And it is the only thing, it is the thing, it is a prerequisite to our survival. Second, every big change, like saving animals, requires government. It is it, simply true. In our society, whoever controls government sets the basic structure of our society. If you want to protect animals, you must control government. And we cannot control government unless we can create a multiracial progressive movement. And in order to create a multiracial progressive movement, we have to defeat dog whistle politics. And the last point, build social inclusion. The, the music video that we watched just before my presentation really talked about all of us being in this together. But listen, that's the sort of insight that we have to work toward, that we have to promote, that we have to build, and we have to do it within our movements, we have to do it within our neighborhoods, within our families, within our schools. What we're experiencing now is 50 years in which some of the most powerful, some of the wealthiest segments of our society have invested heavily in destroying social solidarity. And so when we turn around and say, hey, we're all in this together, that's actually an enormous political project. We can't just say that. We've got to build it ourselves. And that's incumbent on every sort of social movement around every different issue to be rooted first and foremost in an ethos of inclusion. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you all for your patience while I go through that and let's see where we're at. Okay, awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Ian. I wanna jump right into questions because I just think there's so much we can discuss here. And um, I've got a few of my own questions I wanna start off with and then We'll take some questions from the chat. Um, yeah, so, oh man, I'm, I'm so excited about these ideas. And I, you know, as I've told you, uh, like you, when you talk about the race left versus the class left, like the first time I heard you kind of explaining that idea, it was just this revelation because it was, you know, oh yes, I've heard those exact two kind of arguments being presented at these opposite poles, right? On the one side, uh, oh, we can't talk about race, it div it's divisive, it, you know, drives people away from us. On the other end, you know, we have to talk about it, we have to be really direct. And just like, oh, you yeah, having the sense that there must be something more, but, you know, and here, here it is, you really laid it out. Um, so I want to ask, given that, you know, that, that distinction, these sort of three realities, um, I want to ask about the, the recent wave of uh, Black Lives Matter protest and the kind of fallout from that and how that's, how that, kind of impacts or how that changes how we think about this stuff. So Merge Left, the book, your the latest book came out less than a year ago. Um, and yet the political landscape in the US has really kind of fundamentally changed in some ways, or maybe, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't in the last year um, or in the last couple of months. Um, particularly, you know, it seems like a political message that's sort of focused unabashedly on racial justice is getting a lot more traction. Um, and, you know, major media outlets kind of coming out with, with really overt racial justice messaging and hollow, you know, symbols like Chuck Schumer kneeling and Kente cloth, all this kind of stuff. Um, on the other hand, we've seen mass protests before that only have a temporary impact on public opinion. So basically the question is, has, have the recent protests and their fallout changed the way that you think about kind of the viability of that racial, pure racial justice message or just, yeah, how, how, how has that impacted the way you think about this stuff? So, so I think that the recent protests are 
courageous, they're, they're amazing, they're shifting the political imagination, they're making um, huge contributions to what's possible in terms of racial justice. But I also think this is a yes and moment, and the, and the yes and is, it remains as important as ever. It's yes, racism is wrong, and it's a form of divide and conquer politics that every one of us have a stake in repudiating. And that second argument is really important because what we've seen in the past is we've seen a long history of racial justice agitation that, that says, hey, we, you know, racism's wrong. We need to stop this. We, we, th th this is immoral. We need to build equality among groups. And at every stage, you, you, you can bring along 10%, 15%, maybe 20% of people who do not themselves feel personally threatened by racism. But, and, 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 I, and I use that, that's kind of a weird circumlocution. That includes most whites. But we should be clear, many people of color, especially if they're lighter skinned or more professional, do not themselves feel personally threatened by, by racism. And those folks are likely to say, hey, I would work on racial justice, except I've got these other things going on, right? That's always the dynamic, that's always the risk. And so this move, the sort of protest in the street they're, they're incredibly important in shifting our imagination about the pervasiveness of racism, but we simultaneously have to say yes, and that sort of racism is so pervasive because it's being encouraged by politicians who seek advantage by trying to divide us. And one way we can do that is by turning around and saying, you know all this business about law and order and protect the police and blue lives matter? That's not just white racism, that's a conscious strategy to get us fighting about racism against black people and how big a threat it is. Skip the fight. The real threat we face are from elites who purposefully stoke division, right? And we can say both of those at once. And it, and it remains as important to say both of those at, simultaneously. Okay, awesome. Um, so my next question is, uh, inspired by someone that I know you recently talked to, Roger Hallam, and you had a, you had a great uh, discussion with him on YouTube going into sort of how the merge left ideas apply to uh, you know, movement building and mass mobilization. Really recommend that video for folks who want to check it out. Um, before talking to you, and I actually think Roger's really kind of shifted since he talked to you, um, but before talking to you, he would have been someone who might have been in this category. So I want to ask kind of a, a question about it that I imagine are like an, uh, an uncertainty some folks might have with the proposition. So stepping back a little bit, animal agriculture is you know easily one of the most destructive industries on the planet, as destructive as the fossil fuel industry in terms of environmental de devastation, climate destabilization, horrible treatment of mostly you know brown immigrant workers, um, and of course extreme violence against, an against animals, um, but support an opposition to that industry isn't currently politicized. So most people don't think of it as um, being a left or a right issue. For the most part, even progressive Democrats like Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez rarely or never mention it and haven't legislated around it. So some animal advocates look at this and climate ac activists like Roger Hallam would look at this and do look at this and say, we should try to avoid kind of siding with one political wing over another. They look at this and they also look at kind of the extent of like political gridlock and seeing that even, you know, even progressive Democrats haven't really had success legislating around their own priorities. So, so they say, okay, instead of like identifying with one political wing, let's try to sort of remain politically neutral. And so, and by this, in this, by doing this, we could be more inclusive. We could even mobilize conservatives. Like we could have people across the political spectrum, you know, be part of our movement. We could mobilize more people, and that would make us more powerful. So, I'm wondering if you would make the case for us now that, um, for folks focused on helping non-human animals, that throwing in our lot with progressive, with the sort of progressive wing of the Democratic Party is our best chance of seeing progress on animal rights. 
<laughs> or best, best, best and only. Uh, we, we should be really clear. Today's Republican Party is Democratic in, in, in name only. It's actually a profoundly anti-democratic party in terms of its priorities. Um, it is a party that is now in the pockets of the very wealthiest. You don't have to do much more than look at Donald Trump as a billionaire and his cabinet full of billionaires to, to recognize or, or, or to look at that, that shift in the United States over the last 50 years we have levels of wealth inequality now that we haven't seen since the age of the robber barons a hundred years ago. And those robber barons are in charge of government and they're in charge of the Republican party. And their strategy for power is A, to lie to voters by encouraging social conflict, whether it's about patriarchy or about the environment or about racism and b to suppress voting as much as possible so that whoever isn't fooled by the lies is handicapped in being able to exercise their franchise so unless you think somehow that animal liberation aligns with the interests of the wealthiest corporations the most powerful family dynasties you should just give up on the idea that the Republican Party, as it's currently constituted and as it currently operates, is going to have any sympathy for the cause uh, that you folks are espousing. Right now, the the other thing I'd say, and, and this is a this is a separate point. You all are challenging a cultural common sense about animals as food. And whenever you challenge a cultural common sense, the, 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 the way knowledge works, the way ideas work, challenging common sense very quickly triggers in people a sense that you're outside the norm, um, you're irrational, you're emotional, um, uh, you're, you're even insane, like literally crazy. That's how cultural common sense protects itself. It does that around um, racism, it certainly does that around speciesism. What's required to get over that hump? Simply insisting on the morality of your point of view, that's a very difficult way to get over that hump. You need to engage in a process of cultural consciousness raising, of giving people a new frame and new information. And I think that the animal factory industry understands this, and this is why they've been so aggressive in trying to shut down access to what's actually happening on factory farms. And of course, it's also why efforts to film what's happening on factory farms and to publicize it um, uh, or, or in meat packing plants has been so important since Upton Sinclair is the jungle, right? The public needs information. Corporations are hell-bent on making sure that we can't learn what's being done in our own society. I think that's a lot of the battle. And so you'd have to say to yourself, which sort of political party is going to be committed to transparency in our society in a way that pushes towards the regulation of unbridled corporate power? And once you ask the question that way, I mean, just, frankly, this is going to require a revolution even within the Democratic Party itself. Right? It's not like you can go to Chuck Schumer and, you, and he's going to be like, yes, I'm with you 100%. Let's rein in corporations in Wall Street. There's going to have to be a big push to elect progressive leaders who really understand that government needs to work for all of us, including the planet, including animals, and not overwhelmingly for corporations. Right? It, 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 that is very much not the Republicans. It's not even most Democrats right now. Um, but that's the goal. Yeah, um, gosh, you know, is it like when, I, each time I hear you kind of speaking to these questions, I'm like, uh, you know, it's almost thinking, you know, it's, it's to such an extent that um, for someone who's focused on, you know, who, who cares most about climate. And I mean, I know this is exactly what we're saying, but it's like, actually, if what you care most about is climate or what you care most about is animals, like your primary focus should be racism because that is the thing that's stopped. it's like actually there's support for these other things it's that it, racism is the thing that is being used to prevent 
like it's the it's the last it's really like the one obstruction yeah right so so yes yes if you think about what you need in order to actually change what this country is doing you need a multiracial progressive movement and that requires that we overcome racism as an intentional strategy of division and actually build a sense of social inclusion. That's the number one thing every progressive group wants. Now, that, that's enormously hard work, but I also want to emphasize the sort of good news side of it. Precisely because race has been weaponized against all of us, it creates the possibility of a movement of movements in which every group, though they're focused on different issues, understand that we are working of necessity to create a broad wave that's multiracial. And when we do, as a political matter, that's the point at which we take control of government. Uh, and begin to have the power to do the things we want. And as a social matter, that's the point at which we build a society in which uh, rather than fighting scarcity, rather than fighting a sense of threat from each other, we actually have a chance to take care of each other, to find joy in each other, to be curious about and to learn from difference, and to make sure that every family and that every animal, human and non and non-human, has the best possible chance to thrive, right? Like the, like the, the goal is, is everything we want and the route is social inclusion, especially across those divisions that have been weaponized against us, that's racism, that's patriarchy, that's homophobia, that's religious intolerance and xenophobia, we overcome those divisions and really build a sense of linked faith and then everything becomes possible. Okay, well, I, um, I'm getting poked to bring in some questions from the chat because I could just keep going here, um, but I want to be a little more inclusive. So this one's from Orlando. Um, and the question is, what, what do you see as, and of course you've spoken to this to some extent, but specifically like, what are the biggest obstacles now to like uniting the left in that way, knowing that like the left is just riven by so much division, so much kind of internal strife and like feels really yeah, fractured right now. So what are, what are the, yeah. So, so I think that we can, we, we can talk about the left in terms of the class left and the race left and the, and the, and the class left, or, or maybe more appropriately, the colorblind left. That's the part of the left that says, hey, race divides us. And let's be clear, it does. Race is, you know, we're a society organized in terms of hundreds of years of white dominance, there's white privilege, there's completely different sort of um, institutional settings in which we find ourselves because of race. There's nothing easy about race. So part of the left says, wow, that's so divisive. We should ignore it and we can go and do these other things and then we'll come back to race later. That part of the left needs to understand you won't be able to make progress on any of your issues precisely because division is the way in which there's, you will be kept from ever achieving sufficient political power. Or to put that in numerical terms, 40% of the Democratic coalition right now is people of color. The energy in the streets is being led by people of color. The racial justice activists, right? There, there's no way that we can generate the sort of wave election actually required to do anything big, to take back government, even to take back the Democratic Party, unless it's multiracial. So, so whatever the colorblind left is saying, you know, don't worry, we're going to focus on this first. We're going to do healthcare first. We're going to do economic populism first. We're going to save the planet first. No, you're not going to do shit because you'll never have enough political power to do so if you try and do it in a colorblind way. So that recognition is incredibly important. Now what the race left, what the race left is doing is the race left is saying, we need to focus on racial justice issues. And if this alienates white voters, so be it, because these racial issues are just too important. And to those folks, you know, frankly, that's where I was coming from. I was within that frame, within that mindset for a couple of decades. And if it really were that I had to make a choice between sacrificing communities of color 
um, or trying to participate over in these colorblind, da, da, da. I wouldn't sacrifice communities of color. But the race left needs to understand that's a false choice. We don't have to make the choice. Precisely when we shift to understand that racism is not just white people against people of color, when we shift to understand that racism is first and foremost a weapon of the rich against all of us, that's not only a more clear-eyed analysis of where government violence comes from, again, government violence against communities of color, it's not only a more clear analysis of where that comes from, it also opens up new possibilities for coalition politics because it allows us to say, we can build a coalition with the majority of whites, not just a handful of whites who will fight anti, who will, who will be anti-racist, who will fight racism because it's the moral thing to do, but with the majority of whites, when they come to understand that fighting racism is the only way to take care of their own white families, it, right? That, that is the fight for racial justice can be conducted with support from the majority of whites. And the, and the race left needs to get its head around that because very often the race left is steeped in a model of racism that sees racism as a white, as a hierarchy of whites over non-whites and that puts the two groups constantly in opposition. In other words, the class left and the race left both need to make adjustments. The class left needs to see the cross-racial solidarity is the only way they're going to do whatever is important to them. And the race left needs to see that fighting racial justice is best done in coalition with a majority of whites and cannot be achieved from a framework that sees white people in general as the problem. Okay, so we've got time for one more question. Um, and I'm going to sort of take it off of what you were just naming. So this, you know, this sort of describing two different ways of conceptualizing race or talking about race at least, or racism, let's say. Um, one being, you know, primarily about white over non-white hierarchy, which, you know, we want to say, okay, it's true. And like, um, we're, we're in the sort of realm of like messaging and, uh, you know, and politics, right? So there's this other way you're, you're talking about um, of framing it primarily in terms of like elite, an, a tool used by elites to stoke division. The, the way that actually is sort of getting the most, seems to be getting the most attention and usually gets the most attention because it's easier to think about is like those are really both sort of in the, in the big systemic space. But a lot of attention and a lot of the way that racism is being talked about like in the media right now is in this very individualistic way, like individual, the behaviors of individual whites. And I know you talked, you named that sort of early on, like um, that, that, you know, the example of the, um, the, placard in Minnesota that it's like, well, people see this message that's the, like white folks come away from the racial justice message feeling like they're personally being blamed. Right. And a lot of even what the left is kind of, you know, oftentimes like individuals or groups in the left are really pushing this kind of heavy focus on individuals, heavy focus on like call outs and cancel culture and that kind of stuff. So yeah, just wondering. So, so we should be super clear. Um, uh, the push to encourage people to see racism as individual interpersonal dynamics, as bigotry, is a right-wing political project. It's an incredibly powerful and sadly very successful right-wing political project. In the 1960s, in the in, in the, at the height of the civil rights movement, we get people like Stokely Carmichael introducing the concept of institutional racism, and it takes hold and we get the Kerner Commission report that sells millions of copies. It's a national bestseller and it takes hold and the Kerner Commission report says, hey, if you wanna understand the riots, you need to understand institutional racism. You need to understand the systems. You need to understand the accumulation of racial disadvantage. That is in the 1960s, we had a developing cultural common sense that said racism is a deeply ingrained feature of our society and our institutions and we need to understand it that way. At which point the right invested heavily in saying, racism's not those things. Racism is when one person calls another person an ugly word. And whenever that happens, we should intervene. But if you don't have someone using a racial swear word, it's not racism and nothing should be changed. That's the political project. And so the, the left needs to be very careful 
that we don't, I mean, yeah, you get the Amy Cooper videos, you get the Karens. Um, frankly, the video with the murder of George Floyd, Derek Chauvin, it's very important to see the face of white racism, especially when it expresses itself as the sort of um, um, indifference to the humanity, to the suffering of others. It's very important to see those faces, but it's very important not to reduce racism to Karen's. It's very important to understand that it's cultural. And I think it's very important to understand that for the most powerful elements of our society, for really for like Fox News and Breitbart, Steve Bannon, a Sean Hannity, the Trumps, it's strategy. They may or may not be bigots. They may or may not use racial epithets. What they do is far more destructive to all of us. They purposefully, coldly, calculatingly stir up hatred and division in our society so that we're busy fighting each other while they rid the rules of the economy and government to benefit the billionaires. That's what we're really up against. And, and let me just add, talking about racism as divide and conquer, that's actually something that's pretty easy for people to understand because they can, they can bring it down to interpersonal levels We've all experienced divide and conquer. We've seen it in our families. We've seen it in our schools. We've seen it in our workplaces. We know what divide and conquer is. And then when we turn around and we look at our politics, we can see it pretty clearly. It's embodied. It's personified by, by Donald Trump. We need, to, we need to be sophisticated in our understandings of racism. And one of the ways to be sophisticated is to say, hey, racism takes many, many different forms. It can be individual. It can be unconscious, it can be strategic. And what this does is it allows us to say, we need to come together to fight racism, especially as a strategy against all of us, and also to appreciate the way in which we're all, we're all also susceptible to unconscious racism. This call for cross-racial solidarity, it's not an easy call, it's not, say the magic words, use the magic phrase, and suddenly we all get along. This is an, uh, this is an injunction that we build a genuine multiracial egalitarian movement. That will require hard work, especially from folks privileged by race. Why should they do so? It is the right thing to do, the moral thing to do. And also, the only way our democracy, our society, animals, our planet, survive. That's the only way. And that's the point. The point of thinking about racism as a weapon against all of us is to recognize that this is a yes and moment. Yes, racism is a, is a grievous moral offense. And it's the most direct and immediate threat that every one of us face. Okay, well, as agonizing as it is to cut this conversation off, that was a very good sort of period. So um, I really, gosh, am excited about how we can continue to just, ah, I've got so much to think about now, especially that last suggestion. This is the self-promotion part. Yeah, there you go. Hey, read the book. It's fantastic. Read the book. <laughs> just even thinking about what you were just saying about the sort of ease of, it, you know, on some ways, of course, it's a difficult call, but there's anecdotes in the book from these focus groups where before you presented the, the race class message, you know, people were like just describing it exactly. And to me, from, you know, years on the left, it was so revelatory, but it's really actually this way of thinking about race is totally out there in the public. So that's really Yeah, cool. absolutely. Okay, Ian, thank you so much. Um, we've got to move on. Thank, uh, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you for the, for the work in your activism. That's making the world a better place. Totally, totally grateful. Thank you so much.